Dr. Keith Smithson here, Sports Vision Pros, with a very good friend of mine and Major League Baseball umpire. Uh, Chris Siegel. So, Chris, tell us a little bit about your story. How do you get from Chris Siegel, the baseball player, to Chris Siegel, the Major League Baseball umpire? Uh, so, I started umpiring when I was in high school for some extra cash. Uh, got uh, my first 10 to CD changer for my car when I was a junior in high school there you know that was before iPods and all that cool stuff <laughs> um and uh went, when I went to college out in Southern Maryland started working some uh, some games in the office or between classes for semester cash down there and they were partnering me up with some older guys who were telling me hey you should go to umpire school I go what's that never heard of umpire school and they're like oh you should go try this out I'm like oh that sounds stupid and the more they started talking to me I was like oh this is interesting so I, I went down uh, for about five weeks in Orlando in 2006 uh, there were about 150 or so of us at the school. They sent the top 25 candidates to uh, basically a trial camp and uh, lucked out, got into minor leagues. And I basically, uh, I called the minor leagues for the umpires a glorified American Idol because you got to you got to go through every level and they basically get rid of people at every level. And if you survive, you keep getting promoted. And I was fortunate enough to make it all the way to the, uh, to the top of the, the pyramid. And you've so, been in the league now how long? Uh, I started working the big leagues as a call-up in 2014, and I was hired full-time about three days before the world ended in 2020. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> this, this is where I try to, to not yell at my friend here on the, on, <laughs> in, during games, doing, you know, some of our calls that might go against us, you know, uh, aside, I, you know? I mean, we always try. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go through some questions that we had from our public on Sports Vision Pros, a lot of our... Um, our followers had some questions, you know, a very unique opportunity to actually talk to one of the best here. Uh, we talk about the best in sport vision, you know, the, the athletes themselves, the elite warfighters, law enforcement. You know, this is the top of the chain and people that need good vision to assess the game. So um, we'll go through a couple questions and kind of, you know, hear from an expert, which is going to be a lot of fun. First question we have on Sports Vision Pros is what's the hardest pitch to judge as an umpire? You know, it's so funny. It, 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 People ask us those questions all the time. Like we, we hear, um, who are the toughest pitchers to see? Who's got the nastiest stuff? And, and there are guys that stand out, for, but for the most part, like at this point, it's almost a muscle memory thing, like a reaction versus a judgment thing. Cause we've seen so many, I'm sure it's the same way for the players. Like you've just seen so many pitches and yeah. you know what's going to be there. Um, there are definitely guys that when they're throwing some real hard cutting sliders or what's that new, Sweepers are calling yeah, them now, or whatever sure, it is. Sure. The slurs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm sure there'll be some new name for yeah. something next year. But uh, I mean, there's the balls, the those sli the sliders are especially around the edge there. There's when they're coming down from the side too. That, that's always fun when you have a different arm slot. Like we're, we're just like batters. Like we, we like the arm slots up here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I'd say probably the hard moving sliders are yeah. the ones you're really gonna focus on. So tell me about where most umpires favor the side of the plate? Do they set up on one side? Do you set up sort of in the middle? Is there a reason for that? They actually there? have us, uh, there's actually a history of that. I won't bore you with all the mundane details, but back before the two leagues came together in 1999, you had the American League and the National League were two separate entities. And there were there was different equipment used in each league. So one league would wear that big balloon on the outside and one league started wearing the inside chest protectors. And when you wear the balloon, you have to work higher and more over the catcher to try to keep from getting hit by them. Whereas when you have the inside chest protector, you don't have to worry about being hit by the catcher and you can sneak into, we call it the slot, the air between the catcher and the batter. And uh, so that would actually, that's what accounted for the different strike zones between the leagues that have always become prevalent. I don't know if you remember watching World Series games prior to 1999, but you'd have umpires in different leagues and they would have to account for the different strike zones. Not because it was, one was better than the other, it's just a factor of the equipment. Yeah, it's cool. But uh, now they got us in the slot though, because of, uh, for concussions and that the odds of line drives and foul balls coming straight back, they typically don't come towards the batter. They go either straight back or away. So they want us to try to get as close to the batter as possible, try to avoid head blows. Yeah, that's great. Um, the question I get, and, and I coached you know, many, many years, my kids, now, the regulations differ uh, between, obviously, Little League, high school, college, and, and up to the major leagues, but um, regulations on eyewear, on, on frames that an athlete can wear, and specifically sometimes lenses that you can have for a pitcher that might be reflective or anti-reflective, um, obviously different, but you can give us a little, you know, what, what becomes sort of illegal versus legal in you know, the frames and the, the lens itself? You know, it's, it's interesting, like, I don't know, I've never really thought about that as far as eyewear goes. Obviously, there's... I know high school, you're not allowed to have any jewelry whatsoever. I don't know if 
glasses are included. I can't imagine I'll be considered jewelry. Yeah. Um, college, you're starting to get a little bit more leeway. And then in pro ball, obviously, like, I mean, you got guys wearing necklaces and jewelry all over the place. And really, that's the biggest focus is something becomes distracting as a pitcher. And even then, it would really have to be like the sun shining off it or it's intended to really just be like, hey, better focus on this, not on the ball. Um, as far as glasses go, I mean, there have been, I can think of a, more than a handful of pitchers that wear glasses out there on the mound. And I, honestly, it, we really don't even go to the second place. It's becoming commonplace for umpires now, too, because uh, um, our Oakley is a major sponsor of glasses throughout there. I didn't even realize this until recently that they, uh, they'll they actually make Oakley sunglasses with the prescriptions that you wear for, uh, for your just regular eyeglasses. So it's sure. a little bit more comfortable and more athletic. So Well, and for us as a sports care practitioner, um, doing division exams for a lot of people that might be pitchers, might be hitters, might be, sure. again, umpires. Um, you know, some of the things we look at is the sports safe frames. I mean, back in the day, you'd see guys in the 70s wear you know, a big giant pair of frames that they might wear to work that bit in the morning if they were a part time <laughs> right. player and, and wear them out pitching. Now we're talking about sports safe eyewear that's going to be impact resistant. And the big thing for us is, uh, is lenses, and lens selection can be a little different. When I'm talking to our hitters in spring training next week, uh, where they can wear essentially anything. They could wear the anti reflection, glare uh, reduction, the, the mirror coatings, things like that. Um, but we avoid this for our pitchers exactly for what you know Chris just said here is that it reflects at the batter. Sure. So if you're being a hitter and looking out at a pitcher with a mirror coating on his lenses, you know that reflects back and causes problems. And you're going to have that umpire come out and say, you need to take I, those off. That would probably prompt something that there's some kind of mirror, especially if there's a sunny day with a mirror, I'm sure. I, like, I don't know if there's really a rule directly about that, but the yeah. interpretation might lead to trying to find an alternative to that. Just one of those things to kind of remember is, you know, if, if you're working with a pitcher and they are light sensitive, they can still wear tinted lenses. They just can't have that mirror color. Sure. That's a big thing. Um, so tell me about where, you talked a little bit about where you set up. Where do you fixate? Do you, do you watch and track a pitch in or do you try to kind of look at that strike zone area and expect the ball to come through? In, tell in, me about a, that. in a perfect world, when you're actually focused on every single pitch, because, you know, just like any job, like you start, Lack of days is not the right word, but you, you you'll actually catch yourself when you're when you start like when pitches start exploding on you like Nolan Ryan's fastball well, he said exploded because it was going so fast your eyes are focused there and all of a sudden it's beyond the timing that your eyes could move with it and you get a sense of when that starts happening when you're working so you can, you go back to the basics and we're just like hitters like you're looking for that arm slot right there above the that's what I was talking about being down here versus yeah. up here and we just just track it in just like the uh, just like you do when you're hitting. So, I mean, we we talk we preach all the time at our camps that we teach of timing is watching the ball all the way from the pitcher's release into the catcher's glove, waiting, making sure you're taking in all the factors of the pitch and then calling it. And it's just um, in a perfect world, you're seeing the ball the entire time from the glove to or hand to the glove. There are some times where maybe you anticipate. I'm sure that happens. I'm, I'm not going to pretend like it doesn't. But when it does, you start catching yourself and go back to basics. So do umpires get eye exams? That's, That's the question. Well, yeah. I mean, at least once a year. <laughs> um, people might argue that we get eye exams every day we work the plate the next day on Twitter <laughs> and on uh, Instagram and wherever. <laughs> you know, uh, all that social media stuff is always so much fun to hear about. <laughs> um, but no, they uh, they, they we, we go through a whole battery of medical tests every year. Um, that's how you and I met because um, they started kind of farming that out to local folks. Um, and uh, go through, yeah, they uh, we go through the gamut for eyes. Uh, I I don't know what the official requirement is. Uh, fortunately, I haven't had to deal with this, so I guess I'm okay. But <laughs> at least according to my doctors. Um, and uh, yeah, they uh, they test us for everything you can think of. I can attest certainly that he sees fine. So any missed <laughs> calls are, are above the eyes, not below the eyes, right? So, um, and, and as needed, then obviously an umpire could have you know refractive surgery, could wear contact lenses, oh, sure. oh, yeah. wear it's, glasses. It's, it's common. There, there are a bunch of folks that do. There are guys that wear glasses on the field. Like sure. I personally, it'd be tough for me to wear like what you were talking about the sports versus regular glasses. It'd be tough for me to wear probably regular glasses behind the plate just because you know when it gets hot, they're on the sl- I can't wear sunglasses behind the plate because they fog up so bad. So I'm always dealing with that. And uh, I'm definitely not alone in that regard. But uh, yeah, there there are several guys that will even just wear, and you'll see them wearing clear sunglasses out there. And I asked them, I was like, are those actual prescriptions? Like, oh, yeah. yeah no, it's, it opens up everything. Yeah. Interesting. Are there challenges to having those glasses under the cage, under the mask you wear? If it were a sports style, I don't think it would be. I would imagine if it was just a regular pair of glasses, it could be a little cumbersome, like especially taking them off. But I mean, if you can. 
you can get your mask off over the brim of the hat. I mean, the brim of the hat's gonna get over the glasses, so hopefully you can clear the glasses. Yeah. So we talk to a lot of hitters who talk about seeing seam, seeing rotation. They see the opening in a curveball. They see the tumbling of you know, sure. different types of pitches. Are you seeing or looking at seams and rotation, or is it more pitch trajectory and where that pitch is going to go? So end up? our focus is a little bit different than hitting. Um, I, I always joke about it, but there's a lot of truth to it. I'm glad I only have to watch it. I don't have to actually hit it. Because uh, let's be honest, hitting a baseball is probably, if not the hardest, pretty dang close to the single hardest thing to do in sports. And uh, so to be a hitter, I mean, they always talk about Ted Williams could see the, the logo on the ball or whatever it was. Like, I don't know how true that is, but uh, probably pretty close. Um, for us, we just need to have a concept of where the ball is. So, it, like, I actually, um, people ask us all the time, they're like, would you rather know what pitch is coming? You know, because that's what helps us to see the scenes, because you can yeah. see the rotation, know how it's going to react, all that stuff. I actually would rather just go back to that muscle memory, just react to it. Because when I start, it, like if I go out and break up a pitching conference and the pitching coach makes a joke, like, hey, what do you think, fastball change up? I'm like, ah, it's about my pay grade. And I'm like, all right, well, we're going to go to the curb. I'm like, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Because <laughs> yeah. then I'm anticipating and thinking about other stuff. <laughs> so I, I'd rather just see the pitch. And then fortunately, we don't have to, like I say, hit it. So there's only, as you think about it, only really one dimension for us, whereas the batters are worried about the ball out there and also the ball moving away. And so we just kind of reacts. So it's a little more important for the hitters, I think. Sure. The the <clears throat> batter's eye in baseball, we mm -hmm. talk about that a lot in stadiums, and it should be consistent all the way through the little leagues and, and, and high school levels. But um, this is where we have a solid colored background of center field so that the pitcher has a chance, you know, to see this super difficult task, which is seeing that ball and hitting it. Sure. Um, I assume that helps for oh, you as well. It makes all the difference. In fact, it's really funny you're asking me that question right now. Uh, we just did a clinic in Charleston, North or South Carolina for uh, our college group, and we had a couple of new guys there this year, and one of the new guys was working at the College of Charleston, and he had never worked on a college baseball field before, and he walked up to me after the game, and he goes, that was so cool working the plate. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, that batter's eye? Amazing. Why don't they have that on every field? Like, he couldn't get over how different it was being able to see the pitch of the batter's eye. And it, like, it, it makes a huge difference. There, there were many minor league fields that we would work on that beautiful fields, but there were certain details that maybe got overlooked. And like, for instance, one that sticks out in particular is probably Des Moines, Iowa, beautiful field, but there was the, the capital dome in the background, the batter's eye maybe could have been a little higher. So there was always issues like around sunset where batters weren't being able to see the ball, which was great for us because it sped the game up. But <laughs> but uh, yeah, it definitely, it makes a huge difference when uh, you've got a solid, like just completely solid background than when that ball comes in. So what's the most fun game to call? A, a pitcher's duel 1-0 or a 15-14 back and forth slug pass? Oh, I mean, if you're giving me the choice between those two, the pitcher's duel 1-0, because it's the <laughs> same exact pressure, it's just going to be quicker. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, it's funny because a, a lot of times, I, I the most fun games to call are the games when you've got two good pitchers on the mound that are grooving because it makes our job easier because... I mean, they're hitting their spots, they're throwing the ball where they want, and we know what to expect, and we got a rhythm, and the game gets going. Like, I, I, it's funny, like, people are talking about no hitters and stuff like that in the field when it comes up and they start losing their minds. Oh, it's 6 8 7 and he's got no hitter. I, I called a no hitter in um, Milwaukee during COVID, and it's probably because it was during COVID, so there were no fans. I didn't know it was no hitter until the game ended. Yeah. And I'm looking around, I'm like, why are they celebrating right now? It's 15 to 1. And I'm sure if there were fans, there would have been a much, much different scenario. Sure. But um, I mean, it's I, I'd rather have those situations where a pitcher is just grooving and throwing, and he's he and I can, you know, we call the dance, you know, like we're working together. And I, it's a lot better than the, the games that are 15 14 that end up going five, six hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long Which I'm sure you can attest to from the dugout. Yeah. We can all yeah. relate to, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> So what's the most fun part of being an umpire? You're, you're a guy who played baseball for, for a long time. You're you're in the show. Maybe not exactly how you thought about it when you were, you were six or seven or eight, but tell me the best part of being an umpire. You're in the big leagues. The best here. part about being an umpire. It, it, you know, it's funny because we uh, we take a lot of things for granted out on the field. And I remember uh, about seven or eight years into my minor league career, um, I was just starting to work in AAA. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching uh, a bunch of kids in the stands fighting over a foul ball. Like, that's something that happens, what, 80, 100 times a game. You don't even think much about it. And I, for some of them, I'm staring at them thinking, man, that's really bizarre. Like, we get to rub up and have access to all these baseballs. And on the big leagues, major league baseball, they probably sell for like 20, 30 bucks in the team store or whatever the case may be. I'm sure, probably more than that. Um, and 
these are all things that like I remember fighting over foul balls. Like the first Miami game I ever went to, I caught a foul ball, but we had to fight for it. You know, like it's just it's things like that that we take advantage or take for granted that are just kind of special from the game of baseball. And it seems like a little thing, but I mean, being able to walk in the field, being around the game, just it's. You know, every job has its moments. Every job has its, you know, downtime, positive time, what have you. But it's 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 a lot of fun walking on the field every night. And most of the time, it's a lot of fun walking off the field every night. <laughs> well, and, and personally, for me, there's there's the relationship side of it, right? I mean, these people are larger than life characters to a lot of the fans who are watching these amazing yep. athletes. But to get to know them, you know, a lot of them are just incredible people too. And, and knowing them and their families, and, and you know, you're interacting with them as as I get a chance to. And it's just like, like we're talking right now. now. You know, it, it's so, and you can totally attest to it. It's so funny because I, I still remember the first time that hit me. I was in a ball, and Billy. Rowell was the number one pick for the Orioles that year, and we're in Blue Field in, uh, in the Appalachian League. And all my buddies, I went to college in Southern Maryland, so they're all Orioles fans, and they're all like, oh yeah, well, what about Billy Rowell? And I'm telling a story to him, and I called him Billy. Like, didn't even give a second thought, and they all start wearing me out, like, oh, Billy, huh? First day base with Billy. I'm like, yeah, I, I, like, I mean, it was nothing to me, but I mean, it's just like you say there. Like, we work together. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's funny, because people talk about, oh, this guy's amazing. I'm just like, oh, yeah, that's... That's John. That's yeah. Tim. That's the guy I work with, right? Like, I, you don't really think about it from that point of view until you. It's different being on the field interacting with them versus watching on TV. And then you see them on TV and you're like, oh, that's weird. It's kind of a different level right there. But then you're back in the field and it's like, oh, it's just normal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so give us a funny umpire experience. No, no names need to be out there. But what's a what's a part you had to hold back the chuckles for that that happened uh, in a game? Oh, uh, man. Hard to keep a straight face sometimes. Uh, no, I'm, 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 no, I, 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 a couple of good stories yeah. coming to mind. Yeah, I know. We're not going to bring names out there because, uh, yeah, we, we have to keep... Let, let, all right. So, this happened this past year. And I'm, I'm not going to give you names or teams because I will give it away in a second. But there was a, a situation where I'm working the plate. And um, the majority of batters, obviously, at the top of the strike zone is going to be pretty consistent. And there are some batters who are a little shorter... And there was a batter batting um, early in the game that uh, I knew for a fact the ball because we also, I mean we we track technology and we we study and we learn strikes on some certain guys so we know like for instance okay this guy I know that's normally a strike on most guys but it's going to be up on that system right and I knew about it and I've had this guy literally my entire career I came up through the minor leagues with him I, we have a great relationship he's a very good guy and I call the first two pitches on him uh, balls right down the middle but they're up. And they look, they look great. The catcher does a great job catching them, but I'm like, no, they're up. Like, we studied this. And I'm, I'm kind of getting into a little bit of a shouting match with the manager and the home team. And the catcher kind of wasn't really arguing, but was like, oh, those are pretty good pitches. I'm like, I hear you, but they're up. And so the manager's yelling at me. He's like, those pitches aren't up. And I point at the batter and I say, they're up on him. And as soon as I say, I go, oh, God. And I look at him, and he just kind of looks at me, and he smiles, and goes, no, 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 you're right, I'm not upset, you're right. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so the next half, the reason it was funny, was the next half inning, the, the catcher comes back out, and he looks at me, and he goes, Chris, you were right on two accounts. I go, how's that? He goes, one, both those pitches were up, because, you know, they go and look at it. Sure. And he goes, two, he is short as, insert word here, referring to the batter. And so I had to walk away from the plate laughing at that one, because that was pretty funny. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, like, like, yeah. There's stuff like that that happens all the time out there. Like, they're just trying, like, everybody's competing and trying to win, but we're also at work trying to get through the game as well. And it's just, it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good repertoire out there. So the question we get sometimes is, you know, does the arguing ever work? They come out and they get all over you. Does it ever work? Do they you, ever you, win you know, a call? It, it's so funny because if you asked me that question even five years ago, ten years ago, I'd give you a different answer. Just because, I mean, with replay now, it's, it's I don't want to call it a love fest, but the, the attitude out there has changed so much because now it's become almost just a, uh, oh, let's see, let's see, let's see, instead of, a, oh, you're terrible, blah, or something like that. Like So the, the argument has gone down significantly. Um, obviously, you're still going to get arguments about pitches and non-routine stuff like interference, obstruction, check swings. I mean, it's, I think the way this is going, that's probably going to be the biggest argument in the future. It's just nothing but check sure, swing sure. arguments. I don't know how you resolve that. Like, you can't compete around the check swing. Yeah. Um, but uh, a lot of times, it's either frustration or a lot of times it's for show or trying to get guys pumped up or something like that. i got to be honest with you. It used to really bother me. And now like okay like say we need to unless someone goes crazy and really goes overboard and they're just which doesn't really happen much at all yeah which is why it really stands out when it does because it doesn't yeah 
But I mean, for the most part, like, I mean, guys are allowed to be frustrated and upset, you know? And as long as we understand that, like, okay, sure. Do your thing, just don't cross the line. Yeah. You know? So. And, and you mentioned a little bit the new technologies, the, the digital strike zone, mm -hmm. and everyone at home can see. Is that something that an umpire is is happy it's out there? Is does it second guess you? Is it validating? What what do you think about these digital strike zones for everyone to see? So, this is way above my pay grade right now, so I'm not going to comment on the ABS directly. But I I do wish that there was some kind of consistency, because if there's one thing, and even the average fan I'm sure can recognize this, there's so many sources of that data, and every source is different. Like our internal source is different than. What's that was close call sports is different than on the scorecard is different than the tv box on massing is different than the tv box on tbs like so i mean you could see the same pitch in five different places and it, three out of five is a strike two out of five is a ball like I, it's just it's i i don't know i mean is it good for the game maybe it draws in a younger crowd i don't know um i i do think it's it's entertaining to me when i hear coaches that are guys that are coaching the bases who played 20 years ago and they look at us and they go, man, we used to have to fight about pitches that were foot off the plate. Now you guys come in and say, I can't hit that. And I ask them where it is and it goes a quarter off the plate, quarter inch off the plate. And I look at them and I go, you can't hit that? Like, I mean, it's like, I, but I also, I get where they're coming from. I, I, I just, I wish there was a little bit more consistency to what was displayed. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I think it's definitely got made us as a staff a better and more accurate staff. Like, I'm, I, I realize that people get upset at us now too. I get that. I'm not sure. stupid. But comparatively, the, the way that we're able to go back and study and see pitches, and like that story I told a second ago, where we learn what's there and what isn't compared to what it was even 10 years ago, like the train that we have to figure out the strike zone, it's, it's as a staff, we've gotten pretty good. The computer might be the resolution, I don't know. Not neither it might be, I don't know. Yeah. Um, either way, I, I, I just, I know we work our butts off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of our catchers have reached out and said, what about framing pitches? They, they learn a lot about framing these pitches. Does so, that really matter to hold that pitch right where you know it's a ball? Framing but is it, such Because an, you held it, yeah, it's got to be a strike. It's such an interesting conversation, especially right now as a secondary thought to what you were just talking about with the ABS. So I'll start out by saying before there were computers and before there were boxes on TV, framing made all the difference in the world because you were fighting. You were battling and trying to be believable. So if a catcher stuck a pitch, yeah, it was great. Then... It kind of went the other way where I actually told a, I went to teach a catching class at a local baseball thing for a teammate of mine from high school about 10 years ago. And it was a middle school class. And the parents almost lost their minds because I was a catcher. So I remember a lot of stuff. And I'm like, I'm looking at them like, all right, somebody tell me about receiving pitch. And they're telling me the whole thing, like getting on the rim, flip it up, pull it in like it's a clock, just waiting to try to catch and it's all that stuff, right? And I go, those are all great things. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, let me tell you a secret. If you move your glove, it's a ball. And the parents lost their mind because I thought I was a jerk and I found out who it was. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe that's a little bit too advanced. And it was. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to do it in high school, obviously. But right. uh, that used to matter. And then we get the boxes and the computers and all that stuff. And I, I got to be honest with you, I, I think I'm not alone in this. I I just call the pitch. Like, if the pitch is there, it's a strike. I don't care if the catcher's up here and goes like that. Like, we got to get that pitch now. I mean, yeah. except for the egregious ones. And uh, what's really interesting is in AAA this year, uh, I've heard more than one guy tell me that there's a phenomenon developing where they're using the challenge system. So I, I don't know the specific details, but I think each team gets like three challenges or something. It has to be immediate by either the pitcher, or the catcher, or the batter. And catchers are now starting on close pitches that they know are strikes, are starting to intentionally catch them poorly to try to trick the batter into challenging and losing one of their challenges during the game. So it's like reverse framing that's wow, developing now in that. AAA. So, I mean, you want to ask if that's helping umpires? Well, if we're worried about framing, we can't be worried about that because that's really going to mess with our house. So I, I honestly, at this point, with all, all the technology and everything, like we, we just we just try to call a pitch for this now. So a lot of youth baseball players, you know, follow us on Sports Vision Pros, follow our social media through their parents or coaches. Uh, one thing I remember as a coach is, you know, really trying to get my players to treat all the other players, all the teammates, and the umpires with respect. Sure. So, you know, That's you a see this street. all the time, right? You see the kid who's just jumping up and down, you know, making a scene because he didn't think he got the call or the strike that he you know, knew was a ball kind of thing. You know, just talk a little bit about the, the two-way street of respect and how you should treat an umpire if you want to be treated back 
with that same respect. Everyone's going to miss a call. You know, they make mistakes in the field. The umpire doesn't run over and say, hey, Johnny, you let that run between your legs, right? I mean, get down on the ball. You don't make calls on well. <laughs> hey, We all make mistakes. But tell us about the respect of the two-way street. And with youth athletes specifically, how they should be treating someone that's just trying to do their job the best way they can do it well. Well, I mean, with youth athletes, obviously it starts with the coach. I mean, if, if, if a coach is out of control and he's yelling and screaming, and I'm going to guess that if he's yelling and screaming at the umpires, he's probably also yelling and screaming at his players and everybody on the field, so maybe he needs to think about some stuff a little bit more. Um, but if, if I saw a player or something like that, unless the player was really going crazy like something I needed, I would try not to address that at the youth level with the player and maybe have a conversation with a coach if, like, if I don't see it addressed maybe between us or something like that. I try not to throw gas in the fire. Unfortunately, we keep seeing more and more instances of youth sports where, I mean, shoot, there was a video out of Fort Myers in September where a third base coach sprinted down from third base and literally dove at the plate umpire to try to spear him like in a football game over a strike call in a 15 nothing game and a 14 under baseball game. Like, I, come on. Um, so I, a lot of it has to do, like the, the kids learn that behavior somewhere, mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, it, hopefully it starts with the coach. Hopefully the parent, like, and during that video, the parents are still yelling at the umpire. I can't believe, like, your coach just stole with the plate umpire and you're still yelling about the pitch. Like, yeah. let's think about our priorities right here. Um, but, I mean, it's it, the flip side is, too, is at the youth level, umpires, and we talk about this with our guys that are working there or in high school or college, like, you're also the adults out there. I mean, it's not just the parents and the coaches. You're an adult out there. So your behavior will be mimicked as well. And if you start screaming or yelling they're acting like a jerk whatever well kids are going to copy that and they're going to think that's acceptable and you just set the boundaries so like we and that it's not just at the youth level it's at the major league level yeah like i mean i am not going to resolve a situation by just screaming back at somebody right away and we now both of us have lost control and where's this going to go you know it's just going to get worse so i mean we spend a lot of time at clinics um talking about how to resolve situations how to talk with people you talk about you talk with law enforcement officials all the time and i mean there's there's a reason a lot of ex minor league umpires go into law enforcement. Yeah. Because just the handling situation. I mean, obviously, yeah. obviously, I'm we're nowhere near as important as them. Yeah. But there are similar tactics involved when you're, like you said, trying to de-escalate situations. Yeah. And I, I'd say maybe not verbally at the youth level, but your visual actions and your demeanor and the way you walk around the field and people can tell through mannerisms if you're upset or something like that. If you try to tone all that down. They'll they'll learn even from that. Sure. So. Well, it, and every once in a while, there's a bar. Everyone has a bar when that bar is raised. We're talking about the bar in what now? It's time to go to the showers, right? <laughs> yeah. Is there a different bar for every umpire? Is there a bar that, that Chris Siegel has I, that, I would that, say, that says it's time to go home? I would say it's different for every single situation. Sure. Um, there are, it, it, what we call it the art of umpiring, right? When we're teaching about stuff like that, because at a certain point, you need to stand up for yourself as a human being. And if someone is disparaging that, you can't stand for that. But there are there are times, especially like if you have a relationship with a player or a coach, where you understand, or it's maybe a game situation will prompt how it's handled, or something easy, like replay, you can't argue replay, that's easy. Okay, you come out, argue, it, done, whatever. Like there's no thought that's involved in that, it's just a rule. Mm -hmm. Um, there are certain things that are, by rule, allowed to have more replay. Like, you can't leave your position to argue balls and strikes, obviously, but if you're going to come out there and argue a play, okay, I'm going to probably give you a little bit more of a say there because you're allowed to have a little say there. And then, at a certain point, when we're starting to talk in circles, or we're both starting to repeat ourselves, like, okay, clearly we are both done with this conversation, the game needs to continue, so that might be a situation where if the coach continues, he might go. Um, obviously, everybody always talks about on TV, oh, it makes something personal, or to, like, do you have something like that? Yeah, the sure, goes sure. And the four-letter word. Yeah, well, well or... things, and even that, thing, that will change from level to level, too. Like, obviously, the youth level, the high school level, if you start cussing at that level, you gotta go. Yeah. I mean, it's just not okay to be doing that in front of the kids, like what we were just talking about. But once you get into even college and professional ball and everything like that, like, but there used to be a joke in minor league baseball. There's three languages of professional baseball. English, Spanish, and cussing. And usually get all three in one sentence. <laughs> so, like, I learned a lot of cuss words in other languages while I was coming up. And sure. just enough to get people aware that, oh, maybe he understands me. So I should not be saying this to him, which I didn't. I, I mean, I took Spanish for eight years in college, and I, didn't, I still can't speak it very well. God, it's a hard Probably language. Probably good thing. <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, but I'm just, like, it's just so commonplace. And so, like, people always think that you get run for cussing. And it's not necessarily for cussing it's 
the manner in which you are using those words. Yeah. So I mean, like, I mean, I, I had a I had a manager in AAA who uh, he was a gunnery sergeant in Vietnam, and so everybody was an MFR. And I was actually told when I joined that league, if he comes out and calls you an MFR, don't run him, because mm -hmm. that's what he calls everybody. But if he calls you Chris, run him. <laughs> and I thought that was one of the funniest things I ever heard. Yeah. And the guy was great. I loved it to this day. I love the guy, but it was oh, it was so funny. So d let, let's talk quickly about vision performance. You and I have known each other for many, many years. We just talked about how difficult baseball is from a sure. vision standpoint. I personally feel like also working with multiple professional sports that it is probably the most difficult visual task to do in this country. Hitting a round ball with a round bat, moving at you know, 97, 98, 99, hundreds now, you know, for us in the major league level. Um, we talk about vision enhancement, making sure your vision is the best, the clearest it can be. Uh, we test things in spring training here with you know eye tracking, eye scanning, making sure we have good depth perception, a lot of these things. If vision isn't up to speed, it can be remediated, it can be enhanced. How critical is vision in baseball from an umpire standpoint? Well, I'm, for us, 100%, I mean, it's super critical. Like I, I joke all the time that I think it's funny that we get drug tested because of all the people in baseball should be taking performance enhancing drugs, you would think they want to be young players, right? <laughs> I mean, obviously, I'm not saying we're taking yeah, steroids, but yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, like, obviously we, we need to have good a view of everything we see on the field as possible. And I know we have all these crutches and all these things we can come back on now with video and replay and stuff like that, but I mean, it's still, if, if for no nothing else, it's all preservation. Yeah. I mean, to be able to see stuff, to be able to anticipate what's gonna happen so we're not getting hit out there. I mean, well, like you said, yeah. if we go 100 miles an hour, we'll see exit velocity now, like, Vladimir Guerrero's like a 107 or 115 or something like that, and Crazy. he's not alone. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, the, the ball's moving out there. Yeah. So, I mean, we got to be able to see stuff and be able to react, just try not to get hurt in the least bit. And obviously it matters what's going on in the field for accuracy. Like, like, we are trying to do the best job possible for everybody on that field at all times. Yeah. Despite anybody's beliefs after the, after a play. Like, that is really our goal. Yeah. So, I mean, whatever there, we can do. And there is some new technology. Obviously, we have sort of advanced scouting in our world with mm -hmm. virtual reality and some of these things where you can actually could have physically see virtual pitches and kind of get your eyes and brain around seeing trajectory before you actually see it in a live game. I assume those are things that you're open to it, as well. It, it's interesting you bring that up. I, a buddy of mine runs a pitching facility here in Reston um, and he goes to the gym with me and he invited me over there a couple weeks ago because they're using, I, I don't know, it's, what's that Oculus thing yeah, or the virtual reality thing? Yeah, yeah. And there's, he uses it for his hitters, mm -hmm. where he puts it on and it sets it up where it's got all the major league parks and it's just like you're a hitter and you're walking with the ball. And it was kind of cool because we started screwing around with it from an umpire point of view that you could take it and you would watch the pitch come in. You could either have the box on the screen or not have the box on the screen. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much calling the pitch a ball or strike, but it was, you would take you know, the two hand pieces and you sure. would take it after the pitch went through and you would mark on the screen where you thought the pitch went through and it would compare it to where it actually went after the fact, which I, it was kind of a cool training concept right there too, just because, I mean, we're not talking about ball versus strike, but we're talking about actual location over the plate, which is that kind of a cool training concept. I, I know there have been other virtual reality stuff that have happened in the past that haven't exactly really been up to par yeah. to be realistic like it is on the field. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people developing stuff as well, but I, I shoot, I'd, I'd be open to anything that would help us to get better. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's what, when we're replay, we're watching replays all the time, you know, like we're always sure. talking about how to get around and see this play and like our, our umpire has actually changed on the field for the better. Yeah. Because we sit and replay three weeks a year and we're watching play after play after play after play. And we're looking and we're going, oh wow, like maybe, oh look where he took that play. That's a great spot to or see how that one developed. And we're talking about the plays, like, it's great having that. Yeah, it's a, it's so much fun. And again, I'm involved with you know not just you know umpires, but also players and you know coaches and, and trainers and that sort of thing. And uh, I'm excited about virtual reality as well. I mean, I think there's a lot of differences between some of the pitch recognition programs that are out there and some of the, just the visual skills training programs. You know, there's the realities of the world. Sure. Um, there's the React. Um, there's the Sharp Eye Shootout. There's a lot of things that I think have good visual skills training that may or may not look like baseball, but when you do these things in virtual reality with a certain amount of repetition, it's training those visual skills, the tracking, the depth perception, the focus, that can then translate to on-field performance, which is really pretty cool, pretty exciting. Yeah. You know, to actually go hit baseballs in your garage without hitting a baseball in your garage is 
Pretty awesome. Well, yeah, what's that cool. new thing out there? Google Glass or not? Yeah. That was the old one. What's the new one? What, whatever that new one is. It's like, so cool. That, that probably is a very realistic thing with that. Yeah. See people on the subway taking batting practice. <laughs> so I want to thank a good friend of mine, Chris Siegel, for an amazing interview. And thank you so much. Now that we dispelled the myth that all umpires are blind, we can certainly prove that there is at least one that is not. <laughs> and, we try. We try. <laughs> and I will promise you his colleagues as well. So, you know, in, Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, it was great. Good luck this season. No, thanks for having me. I Enjoy. appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Well, getting it going. So, thank you. Till next time, Dr. Keith Smith on Sports News and Pros with Chris Siegel.